Good evening. Uh, my name is Jamie Williams. I'm the education coordinator for LTM. Thank you for joining us tonight for our stage management workshop. Uh, this is our second in a series of workshops in the LTM at home program. If you aren't familiar with the, LT the at home program, We've been regularly producing content for the last several months that we've been displaced from the theater. Uh, that's including a reading of what would have been our main stage show in April, uh, along with several Evenings at Seven productions, a music review, and even in an original piece, all virtually. So um, also, if you missed out on our audition workshop last month, um, you can feel free to visit our Facebook page or our YouTube page, um, and you can watch a replay whenever you have time. So. Uh, my goal is to bring several more workshops in this time, uh, so we are going to be sending out a survey in a couple of days. Um, so when you receive that, if you have any suggestions on future topics, please let us know there. Uh, with that said, I think we'll just start off with some introductions and then jump right into our content. So as I said, my name is Jamie Williams. I'm the Education Coordinator for LTM. Uh, I've also been a board member for the last five years. Um, I do have a general theater degree uh, with a concentration in stage management. Uh, I did my production apprenticeship at Hartford Stage. And then I took a small uh, break from theater, uh, came back to it about eight years ago. Um, and I usually do stage manage primarily musicals, uh, but I have also worked on straight plays. Um, and if you hear noise in the background, my son is also saying hello. So yay, quarantine. Um, so next up, we will have. Miss Linda Ferreira, tell you a little bit about herself. So hi, uh, my name is Linda Ferreira and I have been involved at LTM for about nine years now. now. I've done a lot of stage managing for them, done many shows, but in addition to that, I've also done backstage crew, props, lighting design, um, some set design, set construction, a little bit of sound work. I was their production manager for four years and I've also done some directing. I am on their artistic board now. I had been in the past as well. Um, my theater background, I had done a little bit in high school, but really pretty much everything I've learned uh, about stage managing and all the tech work has been at LTM. So I will say to everybody, it is never too late to learn about all of this and, and start doing these things. So hi, uh, my name is Jen Rankin and I've been stage managing for roughly nine years. I graduated from American University with a degree in technical theater and since then have focused primarily on stage management. I've stage managed shows at LTM, but I've also worked with youth theater companies, professional theater companies, outdoor theaters, and I even stage managed on a train. So. Yep. Thanks, Jen. Okay, so I'm also operating the Zoom, so do bear with me. Let's see. And, okay, so. Um, from what I can see from our list of attendees here, it looks like some of these names are familiar. So we're gonna assume that you have a general theater knowledge. Um, so if you don't understand any of the terms that we're using, let us know in the chat. We'll do our best to explain, but I think, I think we're pretty safe there. So um, also we will be answering questions at the end of the session. So if you have any throughout, please feel free to leave them in the Q&A uh, down below and just so you don't forget them and we'll get to them later. If you're joining us from YouTube Live or from Facebook Live, you can also put your questions in the comments and we will try to get to them as well. Um, so I guess we'll just get right into it now. Um, now, if you're not familiar with the role of stage manager, this is potentially going to sound pretty overwhelming here in a bit, but just keep in mind that you have a lot of support um, and delegating is the most important skill ever. Um, so what is a stage manager? Wikipedia says it is a broad field that is generally defined as the practice of organization and coordination of an event or theatrical production. So that is technically true. Tonight, we're going to explain some of the duties that go along with that though, um, and what it yeah. takes to be a stage manager. So personally, I think we as stage managers have the broadest set of responsibilities of probably any role involved in the theater. Um, 
there isn't a definitive list of tasks um, that you can just check off and go home, but there are lots of lists. Um, Jen will be talking about that shortly. So um, another part of being a stage manager is really just thinking on your toes and reacting to different situations as they evolve. You kind of have to anticipate the unanticipatable. And yes, I think I have coined that word. Um, but the stage manager really is should be working on making everyone's life easier um, and helping the director convey their vision. So there are different types of stage managers. Um, generally, we have the general stage manager who follows the show from pre-production all through rehearsals and through productions and strikes. Um, you could though have just a rehearsal stage manager who does pre-production through rehearsals. In that case, um, you would probably then have a production stage manager to take up the role and then call the shows and go from there. Um, you also may have an assistant stage manager, uh, which you can choose to have or not, or even more than one, uh, if it's, you know, depending on the type of show, the type of theater. Um, and they're definitely there to support you in whatever way you need. So um, let's take a look at the first steps that we have in pre-production with the stage management role. So the first thing that I will do is read the script and make sure that I am so, so familiar with the script. Um, and then I make an appointment with the director um, so that I can understand what they're looking for in the process and what their vision of the show looks like. Um, then we need to prepare for auditions. So depending on the theater, that might be um, printing off audition forms or putting together audition forms even, um, or copying sides for the auditioners to, to read. Um, this is also the time I put together my stage manager's kit. Um, the stage manager's kit includes any kind of over-the-counter medications, first aid supplies that you could probably think of, um, every little piece of portable office supplies imaginable. imaginable. Um, I always buy a huge new giant pack of pencils for every production, and they will all disappear, but it's always good to have. Um, Personally, my kit is kept in a three-tiered rolling makeup case, um, which some people might say is overkill. I don't think so, um, but it can be whatever you want. It can be in a backpack, it can be a suitcase, toolbox, whatever you need it to be. Um, but this is where we're coming back to those anticipating skills. So you have to be ready for anything and your kit is really one of your best tools to help you with that. So during your auditions, you are going to then begin your role as liaison, which really you'll keep throughout this whole process. You're During the production, you're going to be the liaison between pretty much almost everyone, um, between the director and the rest of the cast, the actors and the director for non-acting uh, issues, uh, the theater staff and the production staff and actors in some cases. So on the night of auditions though, you will need to keep the event very organized and the lines of communication open between all parties. Um, so you'll bring the actors in, make sure that they have all the correct sides that they might need, give them any instructions they might need, where to go. Um, you'll wanna make sure that the audition committee has all the pertinent for information that they need for that. So their audition form, the resume, headshot, if they have them. Um, you also might wanna call attention to something for the next person, for example, you know, the next person coming in is only auditioning for a, one certain role. So it's important to know that uh, in advance, if possible. So after auditions, you're going to be putting together a conflict calendar based on the audition sheets, as well as a contact sheet. Usually the director will put together the um, rehearsal calendar, um, especially with a musical, but that is not always the case. So sometimes you will do that. And now Jen will talk to us a little bit about that paperwork. Okay, so. So, okay, so now that auditions have happened and you're beginning to get ready for working on a show, there's some paperwork that you can work on that's gonna make your job a lot easier down the line. And one of the first items that you can create for yourself is a scene breakdown. And so a uh, scene breakdown is a way of breaking down the show so you can easily see how many pages are in a scene, what characters are involved, what happens in the scene and where it takes place. I also like to include a notes column in mine. Uh, that way I can put any props that are mentioned in the script or any unique or specific uh, scene directions that the script may call for that way, if we want to include them, we can have that discussion about where they need to go. 
Um, and having a scene breakdown helps you quickly answer any questions that your director or designers may have during production meetings or if something comes up at rehearsal. It's much easier than flipping through the script being like, oh, I know this happened somewhere. Um, you can look at your scene breakdown and find it quickly. So another important document that you're going to want to create for yourself is a contact sheet. So a contact sheet is as simple as a list of names, phone numbers, and emails for everyone involved in the show. Uh, by putting everything together in one document, it means you don't have to go searching through audition sheets when an actor's late to rehearsal or you need to set up a meeting with your costume designer. Uh, your contact sheet can simply be a list of everyone involved, but you do still typically separate your cast from your design and production team. Just that way, if your actor is late, you're not searching through 20 some odd names, you're searching through just the cast. Um, so if you want, you can format your contact sheet a little bit just to make it easier to read for yourself. Uh, for this one, I've got the main design team at the top, and those are the people who are likely going to need to be at production meetings or they are very specific to this show. Um, and then I have the stage management team and the actors are then listed and the actors are all alphabetical. That way, when they are inevitably late for rehearsal, I can just find them quickly and easily to call them and be like, hi, where are you? Um, and then I have the theater staff, which varies from theater to theater as to who you have in that list. It can be the people who are working on the show. It can be the people who you feel that you need to contact. It's the artistic director, the executive director, production manager, technical director, anybody who you may need to get a, a hold of at some point during the process. Now, some stage managers distribute contact sheets to everyone involved in a show, um, actors, designers, anyone. I personally will only distribute contact sheets if a director has asked me and I have received permission from everyone listed on the sheet. Whatever way you decide to go or whatever the policy of the theater you're working at is, the biggest thing to remember is that you need to remind everyone who receives the contact sheet that the names and numbers and emails on it are confidential and they are only meant for that show um, and they shouldn't be spreading it around to other people. So as part of prep for the show, uh, as Jamie said, you're gonna work, either your director will send you a rehearsal schedule or you will work with the director to create one. Um, I have had some directors just send it to me as a bulleted list. And if that's the case, I tend to make them into calendars. So it is easier to read and clearer to everybody as to when they have to be there. Um, so in the calendar, you can include the rehearsal time, a brief description of what you're gonna be doing that day and any other notes that the actors may need like the off book date or when tech starts. Um, or anything that like that. Now, when your actors filled out their audition forms, they likely also included all of their conflicts that they have for the rehearsal process, or they're going to continually tell you their conflicts as their work schedules change. Um, in order to make sure you don't forget when people are gonna be there, you can create a conflict calendar for yourself. And this can be as simple as printing off an extra rehearsal calendar and writing in all the days where people are gonna be late or they're not gonna be there. But that way you know and you're not gonna forget and be calling somebody asking why they're not at rehearsal when they've told you they have this conflict and they're not gonna be there. Um, so now that you've created some of this paperwork, uh, you are ready to get started for rehearsals, which Linda will now explain. Maybe. All right. So we are now at rehearsal time. Um, got all your paperwork, you're ready to go. At this point, you and your director are now the main points of contact with your cast for anything to do with this show. So similar to your director as the stage manager, you should plan to be at all rehearsals. If you can't be there, make sure that you get coverage and make sure that your director knows that you won't be there. Um, the two of you need to work very closely together and they certainly wouldn't want a surprise to have you not at a rehearsal and they didn't know about it. So at the first, very first rehearsal, one of the things that, that the stage manager needs to do is make sure that the cast has your contact information, super important, um, because they need to be able to get in touch with you and you have the, the contact list, but they're gonna be calling you at different times. And at that first rehearsal, you should also communicate any procedures, protocols that are part of your theater. So for example, um, and it was mentioned a little bit already, they need to notify who they have to call if they're gonna be late or they need to miss a rehearsal. Typically that is the stage manager, 
men, which is why they need your contact information. But anything that they need to know, whether it's about parking, the building, anything, make sure that they, they have all that information right up front. Um, so for the rehearsal nights, make sure that you as the stage manager arrive before the cast is called. Um, at LTM, the stage manager is actually the one who opens the building and makes sure that everybody can even get in. So you have to be the first one there, but definitely allow yourself time before the cast is going to arrive. This way you can make sure that everything is ready for the rehearsal. You have the schedule, you know what you're supposed to work on. So if you're rehearsing a scene, let's say that needs to be inside a living room and there's supposed to be a couch and some chairs, well, make sure that there's something up on the stage that can work as a couch and chairs. Even if you don't have the real thing yet, just put some chairs up there. Something so that the actors have something to work with. You know, if you're doing a music rehearsal, make sure that there's a piano available. Whatever it is, make sure that everything's ready. Um, you should also make sure that the stage is kept clean. So if the set is being built, take a look if you can sweep the stage for any screws or debris because you wanna make sure that everything's safe for everyone. Um, and really a stage manager, you're just kind of looking out for all of those things. So once everything's set up, you're gonna be having your cast arrive. You need to take attendance of who's there. You can do that as having a sign-in sheet. Um, if the cast is smaller, you know, you may just be able to look for the five people who are supposed to get there. But if somebody is late, it's typically the stage manager's job to call that person, as Jen had mentioned, and be like, hey, where are you? Sometimes they just forgot. Sometimes, who knows? Uh, maybe they got held up at work. But always keep your phone with you and be ready to make those phone calls. So now... We've got a cast, we've got a stage set, we're ready for rehearsal. So the, one of the biggest things that a stage manager is doing throughout the rehearsal process is keeping what's called a prompt book. The prompt book is really just a big binder with the script in it and anything and everything else can go in there, your contact sheet rehearsal schedules, but the big thing is the script. And what you're doing in that book is taking what's called blocking notes um, and you're gonna record them in that prompt book. So that's gonna be anything that happens on the stage, you're writing down. So if an actor's coming in from stage left, they need to cross down to stage right, you're putting in who's entering, where they're going, where they're entering from, whatever happens. If they sit, they stand, they pick up a prop, all those things you need to record in the book for everyone that's on the stage. So sometimes it gets a little crazy when you've got five actors moving around at once and you're trying to write down whatever big sentences or paragraphs you can just have real small shorthand notes i've done pictures when i've got a lot of things going on with you know oh i've got three people standing here and another bunch over here it's whatever really works for you and it's clear so that you can understand and somebody else if they looked at it could understand what's supposed to happen um, all of this, I would say, make sure to do in pencil. Um, it's going to change a lot. And so be prepared, have a nice big eraser uh, to erase it and be retaking those notes throughout the process. So you may ask yourself, well, why am I writing all this down? Shouldn't the actors know where they're supposed to go and what to do? And aren't they writing it down? Well, they're supposed to, and most of them do. But there's definitely times where um, they may have written it down, but it may have changed two or three times and they didn't get the last time written down. So there may be questions that come up as to, wait, who was supposed to go where? I, or two people may have written down something different and there's a conflict about it. They're going to look to you to say, hey, what, what's supposed to happen? We've also had situations, you know, somebody is sick and needed to miss a rehearsal. And then when they show up, you would have all those blocking notes and you can tell them what they need to do so that the next time that scene is rehearsed, they can jump right in and the director doesn't need to go through everything all over again. I have had situations where a cast member needed to drop out. And again, we get a new person in, so I've got to go through those blocking notes with that new person. In addition to all those cast related reasons, um, 
we also use blocking notes for our designers. So the set designers or the lighting designers are gonna to need to know things. So for example, your set designer may have a platform and then they may ask you, well, how many actors are gonna be standing on that platform? You can go in your book and be like, oh, in this scene, we've got four people standing on there. So they know how big it needs to be and how much weight it needs to be able to withstand. Your lighting designers as well, they may, may need to know, does anybody enter through the house? Does anybody come in in a certain area or need something special? You'll know all that because it's in the blocking notes. Some theaters um, may ask to have a, the, the prompt book kept for archival purposes so that they know how the show was put on. LTM does not do that, but some, some do. So they also would want a prompt book for that reason. So through the rehearsal, you're doing all these blocking notes. Um, other things that you need to do is taking note of anything new that happens that's needed for the show. So if the director decides we want to add a prop. You know, a character should come in, oh, I want them to come in with a cane or, or I want this person to come in with a, a purse. You need to write those things down. If a change is needed for the set, you know, oh, I want this wall a certain color or I want to add a window or whatever it may be, you need to write it down. As Jamie mentioned, you are the liaison to the rest of the production team. So you've got to keep track of all these things so you can communicate it back to them so that they know what needs to happen because they're not at all these rehearsals. Another thing that you're doing um, is throughout the rehearsal, if you, know, you may have started with one scene, you're going to go do another scene. The stage manager then has to go and rearrange anything on the set. So if you're switching from an indoor scene to an outdoor scene, you'll go up and move things around whether it's the set, moving props, whatever. All part of your job during the rehearsal process. As you get further into the process, your actors are gonna go off book. This is always fun, especially those first couple of days when they go off book. The stage manager is then following along in the script so that if they don't remember their lines or if they get lost, um, that has happened, not physically lost, but they'll skip parts of a scene, skip lines, whatever. Um, you're there to keep them on track because you're following through the entire book um, as they're running the scene so that you can prompt them with a line or get them back on track. Now, everything that I've said has assumed that you are working on your own. You don't have to do this all on your own. You can have an ASM, um, an assistant stage manager, and what you have them do is really up to you. But um, I have had them help with the setting up of the rehearsal space. Sometimes they're the ones that do all that moving around of stuff during the rehearsal so that I can stay um, where I am keeping notes and such. Sometimes you may put them on the book to, to do the line calls. It's really up to you, but it is very helpful, particularly in a larger show, to have an ASM with take on some of those responsibilities. So that kind of gets us through the rehearsal process. Unfortunately, the stage manager's job isn't quite done at that point. Um, so all those notes that I mentioned that you need to take about any new props, light things, anything, all of that goes into what's called a rehearsal report. And at this point, I'm gonna turn this over to Jen, who's gonna discuss what a rehearsal report is. Okay. So, rehearsal reports. So as Linda said, during rehearsals, you're writing down notes about anything that comes up, a prop needing to be added, the director wanting to cut a sound cue, anything else that might come up. All of these notes go into your rehearsal report. Uh, so the rehearsal report is the main way that you will communicate with the rest of the design team through rehearsals. Uh, and they, your design team needs to be kept informed of what happened that day. Even if you don't have any specific notes for the day, you still have to send out a report. You can make it really easy for yourself and create a template like I have here and fill, just fill it out after every single rehearsal. And they get sent out after every single rehearsal. Um, so how you want to format the report is up to you. It can look like this one. It can look something like this. Uh, whatever keeps it organized and whatever makes the most sense in your head. Uh, 
but it sh all, they should all be dated or numbered. That way everybody knows what the most up-to-date information is. You should also include who was absent, what was accomplished that day, and when the next rehearsal is. You can also include a note to your designers about uh, future meetings to remind everybody whatever information you feel needs to be in there every day. So each department should have their own sections. That way sets know where to look for their notes, props know where to look for their notes, etc. Uh, if a note applies to more than one department, for example, a character needs to have a purse where the purse itself might be coming from the props department, but it needs to match their costume, you can put that note in both sections or you can simply put the note in one section and then in the other one say, please see props note whatever about the purse. And they will then go refer to the section that they need to look at. Um, so when writing notes to designers though, remember that they are not there with you. They are not seeing what you're seeing at rehearsal. They're not hearing what you're hearing at rehearsal. So try to be as specific as possible with them about what you need and how it will be used. For example, in this report, um, props note number three says that the chair is going to be kicked over every night. And this lets the prop team know that the chair is going to take some abuse. And so it either needs to be sturdy enough to handle that or they should be prepared to fix it after every show. The more information you can give your design team ahead of time, the better. So you've written this whole report. Now, who are you sending it to every night? Uh, all of your designers get the report. Your director gets the report. Uh, if any of your designers have an assistant, so if there's an assistant set designer or anything, they also would get the report. And if you yourself have an assistant stage manager, that person gets the report as well. Beyond that, it is largely up to the theater. Um, if you have a production manager or a technical director, they need to receive the reports. Some theaters have you send it to the artistic director or the executive director so that they can know what is going on every day. The only people who will never ever receive a rehearsal report are the actors. They need to focus on learning their lines and learning their blocking. They don't need to know that we want to change the color of the set or that the psych needs to be as far upstage as we can get it. It's not information that they need. So in general, remember that the more specific you can be with your reports, the better. And the, they need to be sent out every single night, even if you don't have any notes in them. So as you're going through rehearsals, you're eventually going to get to tech rehearsals, which Linda will explain in a minute. But prior to starting tech rehearsals, there are a few paperwork items that you should prepare to make life easier for yourself. So the first is deck sheets. Your tech crew is coming in at the start of tech week and they have that one week to learn everything that they need to do for the show. And the deck sheet is the way to help them. So it's a list of everything that the crew has to do and when they have to do it. It should indicate what needs to be done, where it needs to happen and when it needs to happen. If you know that you're gonna have the same stage crew every night like this show had, you can assign roles to each person so that they know what they need to do each night. Um, but in a lot of community theater productions, your tech crew may rotate based on people's conflicts. Um, and just like rehearsal reports, you can format your deck sheet however makes the most sense to you. Uh, so this is a deck sheet from LTM's production of Mamma Mia, and we had different crew for some shows. So rather than assigning roles, we just wrote the word crew in the uh, who column. Um, and the reason that even though it just says crew, we still put it because sometimes actors can be used for set changes. So that way, you know who, whether it's a stage crew responsibility or an actor has been assigned to it. Um, in my deck sheets, uh, I also like to include a Q slash notes column on the sheets to give the crew some more information. So using this one as an example, uh, in Mamma Mia, the set needed to rotate. And in that first rotation, it happened at the end of the song, Honey, Honey. Uh, on a specific line from Sophie, but the crew also needed to know that the actress playing Donna would be standing on the set as it spun, and that they had to make sure the props on stage had been moved out of the way before the set could spin. You as a stage manager cannot be backstage with the stage crew while the show is going on, and you may not have the ability to communicate with all of them at the same time. So the more information that you can give them ahead of time, the more it will help them do their jobs efficiently. Um, so. As Linda said, while rehearsals are going on, it is largely up to you as the stage manager and possibly your assistant to move props around as needed when they're changing from scene to scene. Um, but once you get into tech, this is something that you can delegate and have your set crew help you with. But in order to do that, they need to know where stuff goes. So you can create a props preset list for them. So this is a list that tells the reader exactly where every prop should start, whether it's on stage, backstage, or in an actor's pocket. Uh, Personally, before every performance, I will take the prop preset list and at least one other person of from the stage crew and go through 
every single item and check to make sure that it is all where it needs to be and it is all in the right place. I take someone with me to make sure that they are also seeing the prop and so that both of us are responsible and we both have agreed that yes, it is where it needs to be. And if something isn't where it needs to be, we both, there are now two of us who know that we need to go find it. And that way someone doesn't forget or get pulled into some other task and forget to find it later. If you check that all the props are there, your actors are less likely to go on stage without them, which is always good. Um, so the one other piece of paper that you may want to have prior to starting tech is a pre-show and post-show checklist. These are basically what they sound like. Uh, it's a checklist of everything that the crew needs to get done before and after each show. So for example, the stage needs to be swept, you need to preset all the props, the set pieces need to be in the right place. Some shows have more specific items that need to occur each night. So this checklist is from LTM's production of Murder on the Orient Express, and we needed fog machines that had to be plugged in, and the front curtain needed to be closed before the audience could enter. Um, by having a pre-show checklist, it makes sure that everything is done before the show, and a post-show checklist makes sure that nothing is left on at the end of the night. Uh, and it means that no props are going to be lost or anything else. It just makes it's an easy way to keep things organized and not forget anything. If you have these lists done before tech, it means that your stage crew can help ensure that all of these elements happen, and it takes a little bit of that burden off of your shoulders. Um, so now that you have all these items ready and you have your stage crew to help you, you're ready for tech, which Linda will now discuss. All right. And if you hear, there's a thunderstorm happening in the background. So, you know, all fun. Um, so tech, we're at tech. And, and I think probably a lot of people think of tech as the official tech week, that week where everybody's there and everything happens. But there's actually three different types of tech, at least that I'm going to talk about. Um, so the first two types of tech are not always done. There's definitely that last one where everybody's there, that sort of full tech. That's always going to happen. But the first two are not always done, or sometimes they're done together. But the first is called paper tech. And this is where you're going to sit down um, with your designers and the director and you and your prompt book. And you're going to go through the script page by page and write in where all the lighting cues and sound cues will be. So anything, lighting changes, any sound effects, anything that needs to happen, fog projections, you're just going to write it in the script. You're not actually going to see anything yet. Just write it down. The next one is called dry tech. Um, sometimes you'll do it with the paper tech, but otherwise you'll do it separately. And this is a rehearsal without actors yet but now you're gonna actually see all the lighting cues, hear the sound cues. Sometimes you could even bring in your set crew and see the set changes happen if it's a very complicated show, but that's part of dry tech. Then you finally get to the full tech where you bring all your actors in and everything has to come together with the actors and all the technical elements. At this point, Microphones are also added in addition to all the other sound and lighting. Your fog is going to be there if needed, projections, everything. Um, final props are brought in at this point. So, you know, you've, you've got a lot of different props that you've probably been using, but let's say your show requires actors to actually eat real food on the stage. That's going to get start to use during tech as well. Uh, you'll also do your final spike marks on the stage. We haven't really mentioned that, but all of the set pieces that you have have to end up in a specific location. During tech week, you're going to make sure that you know exactly where everything's going to end up. So you, the stage manager will be responsible for making sure all that's marked for everybody. Costume and costume changes are going to happen now. That's something um, you know, you would think, well, what do I have to do with costumes? But if there's a big costume change, the, the stage manager needs to know so that they're sure that there's enough time for that to happen or to be prepared to make adjustments if someone's costume change takes longer than needed. Then um, the backstage crew, is, as Jen mentioned, comes in at this point too. And this is typically, unless you did a dry tech, this is the typically the first time that crew is seeing anything about the show. They have a week to get it all under control and be ready to go. So they're learning everything. They will definitely use that deck sheet 
that Jen mentioned and the props preset to start learning what they need to do. You as the stage manager are responsible for training them. If you have an ASM, you can totally assign that to them because hopefully they've been at some of the rehearsals and know everything that has to happen. And, and this is a great thing to assign to the ASM to be responsible for teaching the, the crew because you will have a lot going on during tech week. Um, so at, during tech is when the stage manager is really starting to take over the, the show from the director because of all the technical elements that have to come together and the show has to run smoothly. Your prompt book that you took all those blocking notes in is now going to have all of your lighting cues and your sound cues, your set changes are going to be written in there and anything else that you need to be aware of so that as you're running the show, um, you're prepared for anything that comes up. That's kind of one of the things Jamie was saying at the beginning, you, you just have to be prepared. For the actual tech, you're going to start usually with a tech day. That day is going to slowly build in all the technical elements with everything the actors have been doing. You may start that day with what's called a cue to cue. And this is where the show is run specifically for the technical elements. So you could be starting the show, but if you have a long section where it's just actor dialogue and there's no lighting, sound, or any other cues that have to happen, you, you as a stage manager can say, okay, stop. We're gonna skip ahead and go to whatever next part. And everybody on stage has to shuffle and get to that next part so that you're picking up right before your next cue. So this, this allows the director to see all the cues. It allows you to, to know where they all need to be called and get them all appropriately um, in your script. At LTM, we typically try to also do a full run on tech day. We usually get to it. Sometimes it hasn't happened. It just depends how long that cue to cue takes. During the tech week, you're going to run the show every night. The whole idea of this is this is your rehearsal. This is for the stage manager to get all of those technical elements running smoothly, getting all those light cues called at the proper time, those sound cues, being ready for the scene changes, making sure your set crew knows what they, what they have to do so set changes happen uh, smoothly. This week is your craziest week because you need to be everywhere because you're involved in everything and everyone wants your attention because it's all, you know, everybody, oh, well, where am I supposed to be? The actors will be asking you, where's, you know, my costume? I can't find my prop and stage crew will be asking, well, what do I do here? And should, do you want me to put this, you know, the actor walked off stage and handed me this prop, what do I do with it? So you're answering all of those questions. So it's, it's a lot, but um, it's, it's a lot of fun. And in addition to all of that, you are still keeping track of cast attendance and all those things that you were doing at the, the top of the rehearsal process too. One extra thing that you should do during tech, like if you don't have enough things um, on your list to do, but you, you need to also time the show. Um, and that's so that you can let your house managers know how long it's gonna take that they always want to know so that they can inform the, the audience. So, you know, act one's going to run an hour and whatever it is. So that's your job too, is, is to time the show and provide that information to the house. Your very last day of tech. So you've made it through all this craziness. Show is running smoothly. You get to your dress rehearsal. Dress rehearsal should be exactly like show conditions. This is it. You, you will run your dress rehearsal just as if you had a full audience in the house. Um, there's no stopping. There's no, oh, wait, how do we fix this? I mean, if things go really bad, yes, yes, you'll stop. But at this point, really, it shouldn't be. You are all ready. Um, and, and it's opening night the next night. So at that point, this point, I'm going to turn this over to Jamie, who's going to talk about what happens on opening night and the productions. Thank you. Okay, so here we go. So production. So after that long tech week, the very next day is opening night. So 
production, I think, is my favorite part of the whole process. Um, as Linda said, this is where you've assumed complete responsibility for the show from the director. Um, and you can kind of find your flow with it now. So the stage manager, as ever, is first in and last out of the building. So you need to make sure that you're there early to open the doors for the actors and for the box office staff, if applicable. Um, on opening night particularly, I personally like to get to the theater very early just so that I can have some quiet time in the theater to myself. Um, people don't always realize this, but as a stage manager, you're gonna be performing every night as well. You just don't go on stage. So um, I need to center myself usually. So I'll, I'll go ahead and review my prompt book, um, especially if I have any difficult cue sequences, I will go through each of them. Um, if it's a musical and it's timed out to music, I might listen to that music or I might say, uh, I might call the cues out loud to no one, <laughs> um, just verbally walk through them. So whatever I need to do to re-familiarize myself and make sure that everything is going to go well. Um, at this point, your ASM will likely be your deck boss at this point. So they're already hard at work, um, making sure that all the pre-show tasks are being completed and everything's all set in that regard. Um, I'll usually check at this point to make sure the actors are all on site, which is not necessarily always the case. Um, if it's a musical, we also need to remind the actors and the music director um, about vocal warm ups and make sure that everyone attends those. So that is also a good time to kill two birds with one stone and do mic checks at the um, vocal warm ups. So try to do that as much as possible. Um, once everyone is all set and the stage is ready to be presented, you can release the house to be open. Um, I'd like to make sure to check back with the actors a few times after that. I'd give them a 30 minutes to places call, a 15 minute, a five minute, and then obviously places. Um, back and forth, I'm checking with um, the house just to make sure there are no issues with, with, with starting on time um, and going back and forth to the dressing rooms. Um, so after closing up the house and making sure everyone is where they need to be, <laughs> um, actors and staff, uh, we start the show. So. Calling a show is kind of like conducting an orchestra. Um, so there's there's kind of a unique language to it. Um, you need to make sure that everything is happening from everywhere all at once, timed out perfectly. So um, when calling cues, it's important to give warnings and standbys. So for example, about 30 seconds before a cue is to be executed, you would say something like, this is a warning for light Q5. And then just before you would say standby light Q5. And then when it was time, you would say light Q5 go. So the operator's button or finger should not be hitting that button until you say the word go. So everything has to be timed precisely. Um, sometimes if there are visual cues, it's easier to have the operator take the cue themselves. So in that instance, you would still give the warning and the standby, and then you would let them take that cue visually on their own. Um, during all this time, it's important to be paying attention to everything in addition to calling the cues. So you're, you're paying attention to the headset to make sure that there's nothing going on backstage at the time that needs your attention. You're uh, needing to pay attention to actually look at the stage and not just down at your prompt book um, in case something dangerous is happening or if something's going wrong with the lights. You know, you need to notice that so that you can um, also fix those issues as they come up. Um, if there's any kind of a missing prop or anything, if we need to, to make changes last minute, we need to know about that so we can improvise really. Um, let's see, now after the show, we would put together the performance report, which is a lot like the rehearsal reports, but Jen is gonna talk a little bit about that. Okay, so performance reports. So the performance report is like your rehearsal report, except it informs your design team about what went well or what didn't go well during a performance. So for example, if a prop broke, it needs to be fixed before the next show. It has to go in the report. That way people know that it needs to be fixed. Um, they're not mind readers. They can't just know what happened. Uh, in the report, um, there we go. It is noted. So like in this report, we noted that uh, Dwayne and Debbie, LTM's executive and artistic directors gave a curtain speech before the show because it was something that was different than what we had rehearsed during tech. 
So these reports, you can also list how long the show ran, how many people attended the show, uh, when the next performance is. I've worked with some stage managers who will include notes about whether a specific joke landed that night or not, or if audience members' cell phones went off. These reports are the record of how the show went that evening for anyone involved who wasn't there to see the actual show, so you should make sure they contain any pertinent information. Uh, your performance report is sent out to all of the same people who received your rehearsal report, and it is sent out after every single performance, the same way your rehearsal report was sent out after every single show. Uh, once you've sent your report, assuming that the theater doesn't, that you're working with has no other specific stage management responsibilities, you are done and you've made it successfully through the show and good job. Um, and the, like the rehearsal report, you can format it, your uh, performance reports however makes the most sense for you. So you've got this. So I know that we've thrown a lot of information at you all and it can seem a little overwhelming and you may all be thinking, why would I ever want to stage manage anything? that's okay. Uh, there are lots of elements to stage management, but remember, almost all of these elements are very repetitive. So attending rehearsals, filling out rehearsal reports, and running the show, you do them all over and over, so you start to get very, very good at them. Um, and you have a lot of opportunities to practice. Just like the actor, you are practicing your part every single day that you go to rehearsal. Also, you are not alone in this process. Theater is a team sport and everybody involved in the show, whether it is the design, designers, directors, your theater staff, your actors, your tech crew, everybody wants the show to go well. Nobody wants you to fail. If you ever feel that you need help with something or you aren't sure what to do, you can ask. I don't think I have ever been in a situation, especially at LTM, where if I have a problem and I don't know what to do, I couldn't ask somebody and they were they're always more than willing to help in any way that they can. So if you can keep things organized and you enjoy theater, I would highly recommend that you, you try stage managing. Um, if you wanna try it, but you aren't sure you wanna to commit to doing it all by yourself, you can always be an assistant stage manager. I love having an assistant, it's so helpful. Uh, but being a stage manager and watching the show evolve from day to day is incredibly fun and incredibly rewarding. So. I think everybody should do it. Thanks, Jen. Okay, so I think we have reached that time where we have some questions that are that have been asked. So let's bring us all back here so we can answer some questions. So let's see what we have. Um, someone asked, what do you do if there is no scene breakdown in the script? Do you make it on your own or do you get this directly from the director? So, Personally, I found that there usually is not one available in the script and I usually just make that myself. Um, same, Linda and Jen, have you found that to be true? Yeah. Yeah. I make so all my own, yeah. And it, yeah. It, if nothing else, it's also very helpful to make it yourself because as you're reading the show, it's a very, it helps me at least to understand what is happening. So as I, like I may read the show once so that I get the story and I understand what the story we're telling is, but then as I go through it again, I'm, it helps me break down the whole show and be like, okay, so I have to deal with these people in this set. And I also do it, I've set designed before. So when I set design, I'll do a scene breakdown too, because it helps me see how many locations you're in and how to, how often we have to switch between those locations. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's primarily a homemade document. Also, it could change as well, especially on a musical, if you have um, ensemble, um, the director might add ensemble to to scenes that they're not necessarily written into so it's good to have that homemade document so that everything is as accurate as it can be um, and it's also good for the actors so that they can see oh we're doing act one scene two tomorrow am i in that let me go look <laughs> so excellent so let's see um do stage managers typically get paid for doing all this work or is it more of a volunteer job Um, I think that depends on the theater. Um, now, Jen, you've worked at several different theaters. So what has your experience been with that? Um, I, so I'm trying to do stage management as my career. So most of the places that I work at, I am paid for what I do um, because 
if I'm working at youth theaters, it is usually that I am hired in for that show. Um, so I may, and depending on what level you're at, depends really what you get paid. So some community theaters don't pay because some community theaters don't pay any of their staff and that's fine. And um, But sometimes you can get like a stipend for doing a show or if you're working in more professional theaters, you're getting, when I was in a professional theater, I was an employee of the theater all the time. So I had an hourly pay rate. It just depends where you're working and what their system is. I find that if theaters can pay people, they try to pay people. Yes. Okay. So someone is asking, is there a place where we can get these templates online or through you that we can have as a resource for our future shows? So I think, again, these are pretty much all homemade documents. Um, there probably are some examples online. Um, if nothing else, you can probably Google image search a lot of them because um, yes. a lot of documents end up there and you can at least see examples of ones. Um, yeah. I agree. Or, or also, if, you, if you work on a show, ask your stage manager if they have one and you can always borrow it and adjust it to what you need it to do. Mm -hmm. Also, if you have any kind of stage management books, I think, is it Lawrence Stern that has like the typical... Um, college course book um they have examples you know in those so if you find a stage management textbook or manual there's probably some examples in that as well um okay so not a question but jane says ltm stage managers rock you'll learn a lot shadowing this team thank you jane we love you um let's see how does the college application process work for stage management so Jen, you have gone to college much more recently than I have. Why don't you take that one also? So I went to American University, which is a liberal arts college. It is not primarily known as a theater college. Um, so I applied to college the same way that anybody else applies to college. I, I filled out the Common App and applied to college and got accepted where I got accepted. Um, the way that AU worked at least was we you declared your theater major and then you sort of picked your theater track and so you either had acting musicals or production so i was a production track and that was as specific as we could get um i just personally chose to focus most of my work on stage management um but if you go to other schools you can find programs that are more specific to stage management itself and you can major in stage management as a thing i know yale has a graduate program that is just for stage managers. Um, so it really just depends how specific you want to get in one department. I wanted the more, Hi. I wanted a more general theater ed education, which is why I did what I did. Okay, so where is the stage manager during the performance, front of house or backstage? Um, so that's going to depend on the theater. So at LTM, we call the show from the booth, which is in the balcony at the back of the theater. If you look up, there's a, a balcony above the exit doors and we have a, um, I mean, it's a booth. It's a clear plastic um, area with a door um, so that it can be soundproofed, um, but it gets very warm. So generally we we'll leave that door open. Um, the balcony also will usually have the spots for the spotlights for the spotlight operators and the lighting board operator usually sits next to us in the booth sound there is an area on the balcony for sound as well but there are a lot of times where sound is done from the main audience floor um, because they can hear better from there so they have um, better opportunities to mix the sound. So a lot of times it's just at the back of the house on the floor. Um, there have been other theaters that I've been at where the stage manager is expected to be in the wings calling the show or even backstage and using a uh, TV camera, TV monitor. So I think it really, really differs. Linda and Jen, anything to add there? A lot of the time, it just depends how your theater building is built as to where they can put you. Exactly. How do you build a portfolio for college in high school? I think that's probably pretty tough. I did not do that. Um, I didn't start stage managing until I actually went to college. Um, 
So I'm really no help there. Um, I mean, I would add like you could get involved in community theaters. Mm -hmm, sure. Time. Um, you can start by doing backstage work because that's a good place to learn because you're learning from the stage manager. Um, so, and that's actually how Jen started some of her stuff. She did things with like youth theaters and, and started sort of building up that way. But community theater is a great place to volunteer and help out, do backstage, become an ASM. And then that'll be great when you're going to college because you'll have a lot of experience so that when you're there, you're, you're not going in trying to learn everything all at once. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so we have a question from, um, I think, Facebook Live. Um, in performance review, I noticed that you mentioned whether or not there was a standing ovation. Superficial question, what standard do you hold that for? One person standing, 10%, 50% full audience? Um, so it, for me, it's a personal thing that I put in and I think I do it because I ha I worked with another stage manager who did it and I probably copied parts of that form and I, I made my own amalgamation of a performance report. For me, it depends where I'm working as to what I do. Um, like if I was in professional theater, I think a standing ovation would be like, if I look out and like 90% of the audience is standing, then it's a, a yes. But I've also put in like the word partial in there. Like if I've got like maybe half the house and I'm like, yeah, we had a partial standing ovation, but not everybody stood. It, it, it really depends. Some reports I don't put it in. I mix as to whether or not I still want it in. Mm -hmm. um, I change my reports every so often based on like how stuff has been going for me and what I think works. Mm -hmm. So awesome. Okay, so one more question from Facebook. Um, what is one unexpected thing you each have in your stage manager's kit? So let's see. Um, I'm like I mean, staring at my kit. I could just pull it apart right now. <laughs> I mean, right? Like, I, I don't know if there's anything unexpected. I mean, we have anything medical. I mean, anything like any over-the-counter medicine you could ever think of in your life we have tampons we have um um breath mints um we have um little tooth like i have like little individual toothbrushes um one use toothbrushes i have um tools like actual tools i have a plethora of gap tape and spike tape um Lots of flashlights. Um, so I have, I have an extra t-shirt for myself in my bag in case I spill something or get paint on my clothing. Um, and I put it in there like day one and I've never taken it out, but it's still there. And so mm -hmm. I've worked at Essex Steam Train on their Christmas train and, and on their Elf Academy train. So I have a spare elf hat in my backpack <laughs> and it went in there and it has never come out. Um, so if I ever need to be an elf or if one of those actors needs something, I have an elf hat in my bag. I would say um, maybe a more unusual item. I actually have little bounce dryer sheets in my bag and they're great if you've got a costume issue with um, static cling, the dryer sheets will get rid of static. So I keep one of those, I have a little clip light um, in case I need, you know, somebody can't read their script backstage or something, I've got a clip light that can go on there. Yeah. Cough drops, yeah. you name it. Oh, yeah. Paper clips, thumbtacks, yeah. it's all in there. Mm -hmm. I have earplugs in mine because I've, I've yeah. been, I've, I've sat next to a speaker during rehearsal one time to like play rehearsal sound cues and I was blowing my ears out every day. So I have a bunch of earplugs in mine. Nice. Okay, so we, oh, here's a, another question. We are always looking for folks who are interested in joining our theater. Oh, just not a question, but keep an eye on LTM's website for when we all return to Cheney Hall, come play with us. Absolutely, thank you, Debbie. Um, we have one more question, I think. Um, let's see here. Okay, so thank you for answering all of my questions. Great work and organization on this. Do any of you have any experience being on stage as an actor? If so, which do you prefer and why? So for me, I started in high school as an actor um, and then I went to college and didn't get cast. So um, 
then the director reached out to me and said, hey, do you want to come and work backstage? And I was like, um, I don't know. I've never done that. And then I did and I loved it. So that's just continued that, changed my major, did all the things. Um, I have not really acted since then. I think I acted a couple times in college, not, uh, not too much though. And then I did act in one of the evenings at seven, two years ago. Um, but that's it for me. So I have done some of both. I really like both. Um, but I've, if somebody said, oh, you really have to pick, what do you really prefer? I think I prefer the technical side. So I like stage managing because you get to be involved in everything. You, you're, you're working with the actors, you, you know what they're doing. So you're kind of part of that part of the show but you're also working with the tech team and, and you're learning all of the things that they do. So you've got that, you're working with the front of the house and, and your house managers and your ushers. So you just get to be involved in more. And I just kind of like that, that aspect of just doing all of it and not just sort of focusing on the acting. That being said, it's really fun being in a show and you know, you're the ones that at the end of the night you stand and you get the applause and that's a lot of fun too, so. So I have no desire to be on stage. I have been on stage a handful of times, usually either because they're like, oh, we need stage crew in this scene. Please go be stage crew. Um, so I've had to be stage crew in costume and had my scene changes choreographed. Um, and I had a costume change during intermission um, because they changed the stage crew's outfit for the show. I've been in shows only if I absolutely have to be. So I did a summer camp when I was a small child. Um, and the only way I could be part of the camp was to be in the show. Uh, but I had just wanted to be backstage. So I was in like one scene and that was it. But if I can avoid it, I'm not on stage. You, you will not see me. Yeah, I think that's probably the typical answer we hear from a lot of tech people that they wouldn't be caught dead. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so one more question has come in. So COVID-19 is, of course, presenting challenges to reopening theaters. Given the breadth of responsibilities the stage manager has, do any of you have a seat at the table in helping to come up with procedures that will be necessary to begin the reopening process? So, I mean, not really. I mean, Linda and I are both on the board at LTM. We're on the artistic board. Um, so, you know, we're definitely aware of um, things that we're trying to do as a theater, I think. Um, and I think our opinions and ideas would definitely be heard in that capacity. Um, the governing board is more directly responsible for making those decisions um, and the executive committee primarily. Um, but they are always definitely open to communication and ideas. So, so I think Linda and I are lucky that we are, you know, able to voice those concerns and questions if we have them. Would you agree, Linda? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I also think that should decisions be made to open the theater, they would definitely be talking to stage managers and such to find out what would be the things that we need to do. Like how would the stage manager's role need to change? How would things have to change for the actors? So I definitely think there would be a lot of consulting um, with us and with a lot of the technical team on, on how our roles have to change. Absolutely. And I think that's another reason why it's so great that our board is so diverse. You know, we have actors, we have choreographers, we have directors, we have stage managers, we have some of the Wednesday, Saturday shop crew, you know, so we have all the, you know, a lot of different um, perspectives available, which is really great. So I think that might be it for questions. Um, so I think, you know, we've gone a little bit over our hour. So thank you all for joining us. Mark O'Donnell, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> um, so if anyone is interested in volunteering at LTM or 
in potentially wetting their feet in stage management, definitely let us know. Again, we're going to be sending out that survey shortly. So feel free to reply to that or to contact us on our website or Facebook page um, directly if you're interested in that. And a great way, as Linda had said, to get started in this kind of work is to be an assistant stage manager. We're always looking for wonderful people, and that is a really great way to learn on the job. So but thank you very much, and I hope that everyone has a wonderful evening, and we'll see you all again soon. Bye.